Our scripture this morning is uh, Revelation 22, verses 10 to 17. I would just uh, like to mention it's great to have Albert Neal back with us after his extended stay in the hospital. So we just praise the Lord that he has brought him back to us. So reading uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for time, the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every one according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right, the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify you, to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Thank you, Nick, for sharing the scripture with us this morning. Keep your Bibles open there in Revelation, although we'll be looking at a a number of other passages as well this morning. Just wanted to uh, say a special welcome to Rob and Audrey Burns, who are here with us this morning. Came down uh, for some of those who are being baptized. And then I see Mr. and Mrs. Wagstaff are with us this morning. So welcome to you and others that I didn't have a chance to get around and welcome you this morning. We're certainly glad you're here. Trust your hearts have been blessed as we uh, have had the baptism. It's always a very special time. Uh, for me as a pastor, to see those that have made professions of salvation and, and then to obey the Lord and walk with Him uh, in this way. And we pray that you will continue to come alongside of these folk and help them to continue to grow in Christ, show them love, make them feel a part of our family. And at the end of the service this morning, we'll be having eight people, those six that were baptized plus two others uh, that have previously been baptized, they'll be coming to join with us in fellowship as well. So we get the opportunity to extend the right hand of fellowship to those. I think I heard somebody say a welcome to Albert Neal who was here this morning. Uh, see him back there. Welcome. So delighted to see you here and uh, uh, glad that you're doing better. Continue to pray for Albert and his family at this time. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, Thank you so much for your blessing upon our lives. Thank you for, Lord, a joyous time of seeing new believers step out and express their faith in you and be willing, Lord, to publicly acknowledge you as their Savior and Lord and their desire, Lord, to see you change their lives. Father, we can't do it ourselves. We come to you because you change us. And we pray that they might continue to experience that life-changing power of Christ. And Father, we look forward to that day when we shall be presented faultless before the throne of grace. Today, we pray you'd open our hearts and minds as we come to this word of God. We pray, Father, for its blessing to be poured out upon us. You tell us that if we read and study this book, there is a special power and blessing to this book of Revelation. And I pray that our people would have already experienced some of that change and transformation from the truth that you give us in this book. Father, I pray for your anointing this morning. I'm just a man. I'm a man of like passions. And Lord, I can't do anything apart from the filling of your precious Holy Spirit. So fill me and use me today to lift up and exalt Jesus Christ to lift our eyes and our focus and our attention towards him. And may there be a desire in our hearts today to live in a way that's pleasing in his sight. 
Father, meet with us here as you have in the music. Meet with us now in the word as we come to worship you by the way we listen to it, by the way we give attention to it, by the way we respond to it. For Christ's sake, amen. The last time we were in the book of Revelation, we were talking about the last invitation that's here, and we read about that in this passage, and we're invited to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that an amazing thing? I, I don't get invited to the prime minister's house. Uh, I don't get invited to a lot of places, but I get invited to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the King of Kings and the Lord of all lords. And I don't know if you've ever stopped to just think about what a wonderful privilege that is. And we've been learning about this all the way through the book of Revelation, and we're down now to this last chapter. I didn't say last sermon, so don't get your hopes up, but we're, we're down to this last chapter. And want to take some time to just focus on some things that come to light here. And one of those things is found, if you will, in verse 12 in uh, chapter 22 this morning. It says there, and behold, I'm coming quickly. Now, we've focused on that already. And when he says quickly, it doesn't mean, you know, it's not going to be a very long time. It just means when he comes, it's going to be quickly. There's not going to be a lot of announcement, a lot of warning. You know, he's just, he's going to be here one of these days. Maybe before I finish this message, he just arrive. And, and sadly, many, many people will be caught by surprise. They'll be caught off guard. We don't need to be. We've got ample uh, advance notice that Jesus is coming back. He told us that 2,000 years ago, so it's at least 2,000 years closer than it was back then. So it's, it is soon, I believe. When I look at this old world in which we live, Jesus is coming again. And thank God for that. But as we look at that truth, We've been also looking for the past probably five or six Sundays at just heaven itself and what will heaven be like because sadly, I believe Satan has robbed us of that great hope of heaven. He's got us so focused on this world and what it has to offer instead of the glories of the place that God says is our eternal home. Instead of fixing on what's a temporary home, you know, it's sort of like just a motel room is all we got down here. Uh, we're just here for an overnight stay. It's going to be gone quickly. Even if you live to be 90-some years old, it's over. And then what? God says, I got something wonderful in store for you. If you will come and acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and that Christ is that Savior that God has provided for us and trusting in Him and Him alone for your sin's forgiveness, for the righteousness that's given to you through Christ that gives you a right standing before God, so you stand before him, acceptable in his sight. If you'll do that, he says, I've got a home. Man, have I got a home for you. Jesus has been building and preparing that place for 2,000 years. And we've learned a number of things about that. We've, what will heaven be like? And, and trying to follow this theme of when I think about heaven, <laughs> my question to you is how many of you do think about heaven? How many of you thought about heaven this last week and what it would be like to be with Jesus and thought about from the scriptures what he says it's going to be like and been encouraged by that and focused our attention on this place called heaven because I believe that's what God wants us to do. I hear people say, oh, that person, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. You know what? I've never met anybody like that. Have you met anybody like that? I never have. I've found those that are the most heavenly minded are the most earthly good because they're concerned about the souls of people. They're concerned about the needs of people. They're concerned about the poor and poverty and all of those things and social justice. The people that are most invested in heaven and focused on heaven. And we're encouraged to do that in the scriptures. The Bible talks in the book of Hebrews about a group of people that here on earth were just aliens and strangers who spent their lives looking for a better place. They were looking, the scripture says, for a country that they can call their own. Are you looking for that country that you're going to call your own? That when you get there and you step through the doors, you're going to say, I'm home, I'm home. You know, Mike every once in a while takes that drive down to Nova Scotia, and I'm sure when he walks through the door, he yells, hey, mom, I'm home. 
and she's probably going out the back door. No. <laughs> but he's excited about getting home. Listen, we're going to feel so much more at home when we get home than we ever are at any home we've ever lived on, on, in, on this earth. He's got a place. It's our home. He goes on to say there in, in, in Hebrews 11, looking for a better place, a heavenly home. And the capital of that home, as we've been learning, is the New Jerusalem, that city that's being prepared and, and a, descends out of heaven to this planet, a city with eternal foundations whose builder and maker is God, a city without crime, not one crime in that city, a city without litter and smog, a city without sirens and slums, a city of perfect and perfection and perfect people and a perfect home with a perfect Savior and the perfect God. That's what's the future for us. It's a place where Christ said that we're going to sit down there and we're going to eat and drink. My wife asks me all the time, are we going to be able to eat in heaven? Well, Jesus said that we're going to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and that we'll know them, and that we will eat and drink with them in that place. So you can rest, peace of mind for you, dear, uh, just so you'll know. You'll get to eat there, and I think it'll be good stuff. There won't be any burnt carrots or burnt beets or anything like that. It'll be all good stuff there. When I was thinking about heaven, and we think about what will we do there, some people have that foolish nonsense that we're going to be you know, running around in diapers like little cupids and, and, and floating on clouds and playing harps and all of that. But the Bible says in verse 3 here of, of the same chapter, we're going to serve him. You know what it means to serve? It means to work. It means that there will be things that will be delegated to you and you'll be expected to carry out. There's, there's going to be opportunities and it'll be work that we enjoy. It'll be like work in the garden before sin came, that Adam just did it and enjoyed every minute of it and enjoyed the special creativity of God. And when you think about that, you think about what man's accomplished, you know, sending people out into space, and, and scientists have developed all these medicines, and we know about DNA and all of these things, and we think of the creativity, right, of the human mind. But think about the creativity of the human mind that's no longer marred by sin. What creativity there will be throughout eternity in heaven a perfect creativity, and I think we'll write and draw and all kinds of things that we'll do in that new heaven that he's got for us and the new earth that he's prepared for us. And I think one of the best parts there is not necessarily this part, that there's no temple there. But the fact of the reason there's no temple there is because Christ and Christ alone will be the total focus. We won't have our focus on a building. I know some of you came this morning, oh, we came to church. No, you didn't come to church. You are the church. You came to a building, and we sit here as the church. When, when we get to heaven, we're not going to a building. We're coming to a person, and that person is Christ, and we'll be utterly focused upon him. I think we'll be lost in worship. I think there won't be any inhibitions. Do you feel them sometimes when we're worshiping? You, you'd like to raise your hands, but you're not sure. You'd like to clap, but you're not sure. You'd like to shout, but... You know, the deacons might carry you out, you know. But I think in heaven, it's going to be noisy. And I think it's going to be happy when we get to glory to be with Jesus. What a glorious place it will be. And I think we're just going to be overcome continually by the magnificence of who he is and seeing him. And, and we've been learning the fact we're going to see his face, a special privilege for the children of God. It's a place, the Bible says, place of rest. This is not a place of rest. Don't go to sleep here this morning, all right? But heaven's going to be a place of rest from all of our labors. It doesn't mean we won't labor, but we'll labor in a way that it won't exhaust us. We'll labor in the sense that, oh, the drudgery of we work and we work and we don't seem to accomplish anything, but in heaven we'll always be accomplishing things and it will continue to bring glory to his name. It's a wonderful, glorious place that God has provided for his people. How many of you think that there will be tears in heaven? 
I the only one? Oh, there's a couple of others. See, I think there will, because there's a place in the Bible where it says that Jesus is going to come and he's going to hold your face in his hands, and then he's going to dry every tear. But have you ever thought about why are we shedding tears in heaven? I don't think it's tears of joy, by the way. But we will shed tears. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is is this very thing, that we, we have some idea of what heaven will be like, and that we're to focus our lives while we're here on that place called heaven, and we're to, to draw strength from that, to, to bear up under the trials and the burdens that we have down here on earth. If we can keep our focus there, you know, I can get through because there's better things to come for me as a child of God. Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto man once to die. That's every man, right? Is that, that only referring to unsaved people when it says it's appointed unto man once to die? What do you think? Wake up. No. So it says, it's appointed unto man once to die, and then after this, the what? The judgment. Is that judgment only for unsaved people? No, the child of God will be coming to a judgment. You need to understand that. You need to grasp that as we think about heaven and how wonderful it's going to be, that it's also going to be a day of coming judgment and a day of judgment for the child of God. Now, Scripture tells us that there are two eternal judgments, and they're separated. They're not together. We've already learned about the great white throne judgment which is a judgment for non-believers that refuse to believe in Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, and they will stand before God, and they will be judged by Him. You might put it this way, it's a judgment of faith, of whether you have put your faith in Jesus Christ or you have not. Now, that's all settled by what you do with Jesus, not when you get to heaven, but while you're where? Here on earth. You hear the gospel, you know that Christ died for you, and you have to decide whether I, as a sinner, want to ask Christ for forgiveness or I reject his forgiveness. And I reject God's offer to me and say, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it, without regard for God. And there are those that will do that, and they will beware at the great white throne judgment. But he also says there's another judgment that is particularly for the child of God. And we call that the judgment seat of Christ. JSC, if you're taking notes, it makes it easier. The judgment seat of Christ, where only believers will appear, but it is a what? It is a judgment, where we will receive an examination, if you will. And it's not a judgment there of our faith. If we're at that judgment, we're there because we have already previously put our faith in Christ, and we've gone to heaven because we believed in Jesus as our personal Savior, but... There's an examination that takes place at that moment, and he says that we're going to be judged according to who knows what it is, our works. What are your works? Your works are what you do once you become a Christian. The Bible tells us clearly that there's to be works in our lives that we are to show uh, the, the belief that we have in Christ and demonstrate it by a change in our lives. You read the book of Revelation. It says that faith without works is what? dead, it's useless, that, that you ought to have a faith that works, <laughs> that does something for the glory of God and seeks to bring others to know Him and, and do good in other people's lives and be a blessing to them. There will be an evaluation. And we've already seen a little bit of that evaluation in the book of, of Revelation because if you go back to chapters 2 and 3, what you have there is Jesus says, I got my eye on you. And he does an evaluation of seven churches there, right? Church at Ephesus and Thyatira and Sardis and so on. And he makes an evaluation. He says, you know, he says to the church at Ephesus, you know what? (laughs) I love you, but you've left your first love. That's his evaluation. And he says, I'm going to give you space to repent. That means to turn around and don't do the things you're doing and come back into love with me, right? He gives us time to do that, but he's making an evaluation. How many of you think 
the Jesus Christ in heaven is making an evaluation of Devon Park Baptist Church. Okay, he, he is. You need to get that. He's evaluating our service and our activity for him. And he tells us in Revelation 2, verse 23, that we're going to be judged according to our deeds. That is the things that we do. And says with great clarity, for example, let me, let me just go back to the, uh, the book of Romans for a moment, chapter 14. And in Romans 14 and verse 10, we read this. But why do you judge your brother? Hey, let me ask you a question. Any of you spent some time judging your brother or sister in Christ this week? You said some very sharp, critical words, maybe not to their face, probably behind their back, but you said some things. He says, but why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand, how many of us? All. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the judgment of the believer. And he says, therefore, it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. And so then each of us shall give account of his neighbor. No, wouldn't it be great if I could just give account for what Brent Roy has done with his life? <laughs> That'd be safe, wouldn't it? I mean, it'd be a good one, wouldn't it, Brent? But... But when I stand there and I have to give an account of who, it's not of his life, it's of my life. I ought to be more concerned about me standing before God than Brent standing before God in some ways. Now he says here, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. <laughs> You're going to give a what? An accounting. He itemized account of what you did with your days, with your weeks, with your months, with your life, once you came to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. And he's teaching us here, beginning to teach us about the law of rewards. Remember the word back in Revelation that we started with was the word reward. Jesus said, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is what? It's with me. So there's a reward that he wants us to be concerned about and focused on. And the tragedy is that most Christians, even good Christians, live with this thought. All that really matters is that I saw myself as a sinner, I repented of my sin, and I'm going to heaven someday. And you have this idea, and it's a misnomer, that heaven's going to be the same for all of us. It's not. It's going to be a wonderful place. But if I understand the scriptures, and I won't get to it all this morning, so you'll have to forgive me, but we'll come back to this, Lord willing, next Sunday again, or not next Sunday because it's Father's Day, but the following week, and we'll look at this whole subject of rewards again. But I want you to understand that heaven's not the same for everybody. If, if I could be saved and say, okay, I'm saved, genuinely saved, and now I just go out and live any old way I please without any consequences. I want to tell you there are consequences, right? God is not mocked. You can't go out and just live however you please. Remember what Paul said in Romans when somebody said, hey, I'm saved, so you know, grace abounds, where sin abounds, so I just go on to sin and sin. And Paul says, God forbid. Why? Because it has consequences in this world, and it has consequences in the next world. Now, you say, but I thought I, thought I was saved by putting my faith in Jesus Christ. You are. And you get the glory of heaven because you're in Christ but when Jesus says, I'm going to reward you, is he going to give everybody the same reward? If, if somebody goes out and lives immorally and he robs and steals and, and maybe murders some people and so on, and yet he's a genuine believer and, and he gets to heaven, is he going to have the same reward as somebody that lived godly all of their days and shared the gospel with people and, 
and gave money to the cause of Christ. How many of you think, you know, how many of you know a guy named Lot? Okay, now the Bible says Lot was a just man. That means he was justified in the sight of God because he put his faith in God and he was saved, but he didn't live like it, right? We know that. He went down to Sodom and Gomorrah and participated in what was going on there. The Bible says he did vex his righteous soul every day, right? He was tormented. He didn't get full enjoyment of that, and no Christian can, but a lot of them try, and they try for a long time. How many of you think that Lot's going to get the same reward in heaven that Abraham's going to get in heaven? How many of you say, no, I don't think so, right? That there's some distinction going to take place there. Otherwise, what's the purpose of rewards? We're all just going to get the same thing. But he says, listen, faith, salvation is a result of faith. You don't earn it. But a reward is always something that you what? That you earn. Now, you can't earn salvation. You receive it by the grace of God through faith. But there is something that God says, I want you to work towards. Even the passage in Ephesians says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, right? goes on to say that you are his workmanship created unto what? Good works. That God expects our lives as Christians to manifest good deeds and not bad deeds. And that we're going to be held before God and we're going to be judged according to the way we live our lives. Over in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 3, let me just uh, get flipped over here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and for time's sake, uh, I'm just going to jump in and start reading here. Let's see. Uh, Paul talks in verses 9 through 11 about building and building. He's built the foundation, and then he tells us to be careful how we build thereon. So the way we live our lives, we're constructing a building. Now, I don't know if this is the way it's going to be, but just think of this for a moment. If the way you've lived your life, after you trusted Christ as your Savior, provided the building materials that Jesus uses in heaven to build you a home, would some people have a different kind of home in heaven than others? Because he's going to talk in this passage here, and he's going to say, let's begin in verse 12, now, if anyone builds on this foundation with, you ask yourself, what kind of a home do I want to be building? What kind of building materials do I want to give to Jesus to build with? He says, now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, let each one's work, uh, each one's work rather, will become clear, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you get something of the soberness of that? Do you get the impression that the Scripture is telling us, oh, well, you know, we, we're going to come to the judgment seat of Christ, but it's no big deal, no consequences, it's over, and then you just move on, and we all enjoy heaven the same. Or do you get the impression that the Scriptures teach that there's a monumental importance to this thing called the judgment seat of Christ and the reward that God in heaven wants to give to you, but He can only give it to you if, right? Right? And it's not based, this reward's not based on whether you've trusted Christ or not. It's based upon what you've done with your life once you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. So there's consequences to not living in a way that's honoring to the Lord, not lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ the way that we ought to lift up and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a judgment that's according to our works. It's a judgment where we will give an account of ourselves. It's, it's a judgment... You can put it this way, whether you're made of the right stuff. Is your home made of wood, hay, and stubble or straw? 
Now, it says it's going to be tested by fire. Have you figured out what happens when you put the blowtorch to wood, hay, or straw? What happens? There's a lot of combustion, and it's over very quickly and gone, right? But then he says you can, you can be building with gold, silver, and precious stones. Now, if I could build you a 48-story building out of wood, or I could give you a handful of diamonds, which would you rather have? You give me the handful of diamonds, right? I can go and cash those in. I don't, I don't need a wood building because somebody might touch a match to it and it's, it's gone. And that's what he's trying to tell us about the way you live your life now. You're either building a life that to God is like wood, hay, and stubble that he's going to turn the incendiary holiness, which is God, to bear upon what you're building. And if it's wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to be consumed. And what he's saying is, you'll have basically lived your life for nothing. On the other hand, if, if I live my life with my eyes focused on heaven and focused on Jesus and bringing glory to his name, and I do what I do, and I give what I give for the purpose of glorifying him, he says, you're building with gold, silver, and precious stones, and because you have, there's going to be an eternal reward for what you have done. And, and you shouldn't stuff your nose at something that is important to Jesus, and it's important to Jesus that he be able to give you a reward. And therefore, we ought to consider very carefully how we're going to live our lives and how we're going to conduct ourselves here. He tells in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for what things he has done. In other words, you're going to get according to what you've done. You're going to get what you're due, and he even says this, whether good or bad. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but as a Christian, I'm going to get a reward for what I did good. Yes? I'm also going to get a reward for what I did bad. That's what it says. At the judgment seat of Christ, specifically. So he's only talking about believers, and it, how many of you think that there's going to be a good reward for doing bad? Not going to happen, because that would make God unholy. So the reward for doing bad isn't going to be something good, it's rather uncomplimentary, is, is the way I would put it. it. I don't know about you, but I think this truth ought to disturb you a little bit. I think it ought to be, make you begin to think about what am I, some of you young people, what am I going to do with my life? You see, our culture is focusing people and you got to get to university and get a degree so you get a good job and you make good money and you buy a lot of things and have a lot of possessions. And when it's all over, what are you going to have? You're not going to have anything. And some of you need to begin to think right now, what do I want to do with my life? Some of you young men ought to be asking, I wonder if God would have me to be a preacher. I wonder if God wants me to be a missionary. I wonder if God wants me to be a church planner. I wonder if God wants to, you know, if you've got a good voice like I do, be a gospel singer. We don't know, but God has something that he created you for, gifted you for, gave you abilities to do that he wants you to do with eternity in mind. And I don't think it was to see how much we can store up. Matter of fact, he says, store up your treasures, not here in the bank, but where? Store up treasures in heaven. Why? Because you're going to get to enjoy them there. And that seems to say to me that if you store it up a lot there, you get a lot of enjoyment. If you store up a little there, you get maybe not so much enjoyment, right? Right? seems to me what the Scripture is trying to teach us in relation to, to this law of rewards that, that God has for us. I want to tell you that that time of judgment there that he talks about in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, listen, the day will declare it. We drove up to the border about a week ago, and the guy there had me roll down my window 
rolled down my back window, and then because Brenda was in the back seat, said, put it up again. No. <laughs> he asked me this question. He says, do you have anything to declare? In other words, you better tell me because if I search your car and you lied to me about something, you're in trouble. I want to tell you there's a day when we're coming to this judgment seat of Christ, and yes, I know it's a place of reward for what we have accomplished for him, but, but he says it's all going to be declared. And what's going to be declared? What you've done good and what you've done bad. And may I just say this, remember those tears in heaven? I think there are going to be some Christians that will appear at the judgment seat of Christ that the tears will run down their faces. And yes, I believe Jesus will come and he'll dry those tears. And he'll welcome us into glory because we're in Christ. But I think there's going to be some pain over the fact that we don't have any rewards because we didn't live our lives the way that he intended us to live our lives. We didn't follow the will of God. We followed the will of Terry or the will of whoever your name is instead of seeking his face and seeking to please him. The Bible tells us that this is going to be a judgment where it's a day of declaration. Everything's going to get declared. It's, it's a day of revelation because it said it's going to be revealed by fire. The fire comes. It's going to become very evident very quickly what kind of life you've lived, what kind of works and deeds you have done on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love a passage, and I'm looking at the clock, and I know I've got to finish. Just a couple of thoughts for you to chew on. Over in 2 Peter, it, it talks about this. It says that about those that will come into his kingdom, and they will have, listen to this, an abundant entrance. How many of you want an abundant entrance when you get the glory? Well, then you better live an abundant life here that's found abiding in Christ, because without me, he says, you can do nothing, so abide in him, so his life lives in you and flows out of you, and you love people the way you ought to love people, and you care about people the way you ought to care about people, and you handle money the way that God wants you to handle your money, and you give of your money generously because he says it's better to give than to receive, and we obey the, the instructions of the scriptures so that when we get there, we're going to have an abundant entrance. And the assumption there is that some people will have an abundant entrance and others will what? They will not. You know, over in 2 John, I think it's chapter 2 and verse 28, said that there are going to be those that when they stand before him will be ashamed. You ever been in a situation where you've been really ashamed of something you did? And when it really struck home to you, what happened? The tears begin to flow. I want to tell you, Jesus Christ, and I'm not trying to be harsh with you this morning, because I'm trying to get you to the place where you live the way God wants you to live so you'll have an abundant entrance to heaven. That's positive, isn't it? And you have some influence on that. You have an influence by allowing the Spirit of God to work in you the way He wants to work in you and accomplish in you what He wants to accomplish so you bring glory to His name and have an abundant entrance. I don't know about you, but I'd like to have an abundant entrance. And I know what that requires is even studying this this week, I've, I've done some soul searching. And I've, I've figured out, and I'm the preacher, but there's some things that need to change in my life. There's some attitudes that need to change in my life. There's, there's some ways maybe I need to use my abilities in a different way to serve him and to serve his church and, and, and all that. But what I want to ask you this morning, and, I, and I'm going to close We've been studying this book of Revelation, and I believe that it's supposed to make an impact on our life. Has it made an impact on you? We've been studying this for 40 weeks. It should have made some impact by now. Where has it influenced you? Where has it changed your life? And even what you've heard this morning, 
where is it going to change your life? Would you say to him this morning, Lord, preacher's right. If I went to heaven right now, I don't think I'd have an abundant entrance. And a lot of you a moment ago raised your hand, I'd like an abundant entrance. Then you better begin to make some choices beginning this morning about how you're going to live your life and how you use your time and your treasures and your talents that God's given to you that will have an influence for eternity on the lives of others, in the heart of Jesus, and for yourself, and your eternal reward when you stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. Place to start, and you can't get started until you know Christ as your personal Savior. And after this service, if you're here and you don't know Christ, and you say, you know, I'd like to know more about that, I want you to know I'll stay here all afternoon, if you like, to answer questions or anything else about how to have your sins forgiven, how to have a right standing before a holy God in heaven so that you can go there when you die. I'd love to tell you about that. So you come to me afterwards and say, preacher, I, I want to know how to be saved. I want to know how to have my sins forgiven. I'll spend some time with you. Mike could do the same, I'm sure. But the message, frankly, has been to us as Christians, hasn't it? And I don't have time really to give an extended invitation here this morning, so I'm just going to make it this way. If God's spoken to you, and, and you already probably figured it out, some of the areas and things that need to change in your life, would you right here, without any music or anything else, just by raising your hand, say to God, Lord, and he'll see it, by the way. He'll see it. Lord, I get what you're saying to me this morning. And I'm going to begin to work at arranging my life according to your word and not just the way I like it. That I, I'm going to focus on heaven with my finances, with my treasures, with my time, with my talents, because, dear God, frankly, I want to focus on having an abundant entrance into heaven in the way that the Scriptures outlined it. We've only covered a brief portion of it this morning, but I want to tell you, there's a lot of Scriptures about this that tell us that it's time we got serious about whether we're really going to live for Christ or we're not. That we don't want to be ashamed when we stand before Him. Anyone this morning would just say, yes, God spoke into my heart. This morning will be a change of direction for my life. I will focus on heaven, as he tells me to in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and I will change my life where God leads me and directs me to do so. Anybody, just up with your hand if God's speaking to you this morning. See a number of hands. Let's just bow for a quick word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the hands that have been raised, and I pray, God, these people, because they said yes to what you said to them, they've responded to your truth, would experience the power of the Spirit of God to work within them, to begin to change the things that they know need to be changed. I pray, God, you'd help them to begin to talk differently. I pray that you'd give them the power to act differently and not do some of the things they shouldn't do and, and to have the courage to do some of the things they should and, and to be able to share their faith and, and God to bring glory to your wonderful, precious, holy name. Lord, let your power flow down into these lives in a special way today. For Christ's sake.